In the last lecture, we reviewed theories about causes of migration. In this lecture, I'd like to highlight the other way around relationship. So not how does development and broader change affect migration, but what is the impact of migration on those processes itself. So it's very much about feedback. And the next lecture on the continuation of migration will follow up on some of the arguments that has been developed in this lecture. Now, this is an issue, migration development, that has received a lot of attention in policy over the last 10 years. And particularly remittances have been often seen as a sort of major instrument to further development in origin countries. And Devish Kapoor has even named remittances a new development mantra. The key question, why do we see this surge in interest for migration and development in general and remittances in particular? Why has this been put at the agenda recently? But second, more fundamentally, what is the actual impact of migration on development? What evidence do we have about this relationship? How does migration affect growth processes, inequality, social development, and political development in origin countries? What evidence do we have about this relationship? And are, is the sort of recent optimism about this issue justified? Now, part of the sort of search and interest in the issue of remittances is explained by the spectacular rise in remittances, which is the money sent back by migrants to developing countries, which this graph highlights. Now, part of this increase is artificial because the increased interests in remittances have also improved recording of remittances by banks and central banks and national governments, but there's no doubt that there has been a real increase. And perhaps this is one other consequence of globalization and technological process because it has become much easier to travel but also to, to transmit money. So this is perhaps another way in which technological change in globalization has changed the face of migration and we could see remittances as yet another expression of transnational identification and engagement. Now particularly when we compare remittances to official model development assistance, we kind of understand why the issue has attracted so much attention, not only from the financial sector, but also from institutions concerned with development of poor countries, like the World Bank or national development agencies like DGS here in the Netherlands or DFID in the United Kingdom. And seeing this figure, we can already see that remittances are already way higher than official development assistance, and then it's often argued that this money is flowing directly from family to family, from migrant to their families back home. And unlike official development assistance, which is often criticized, as often said that a lot of money is sifted off by corrupt officials or goes into the pocket of expensive consultants. Now whether that's true or not, it is a fact beyond any doubt that remittances are much higher than official development assistance. And it's often argued that the real amount of remittances is much higher in the official figures because a lot of money is taken in form in, is taken cash back to origin countries or sent through informal remittance channels. So we can understand the interest partly from this phenomenon. Now if we compare the poorest, the lower middle and the upper middle income groups, we do see different patterns in terms of how remittances relate to other flows of foreign currency. We see that in low income countries, remittances are in absolute terms not very high, and it somehow reflects a more general pattern that we see that migration rates are highest from the middle income groups, which also explain why most remittances do not flow to the poorest countries, but to the middle income countries. And that also the low income group is the only group where development assistance is still higher in absolute terms than remittances. Now we see that the lower middle income group are the remittance champions. Most money is flowing to those countries. And that you see the huge gap between remittances and development assistance in particular. Now in this sort of group of upper middle income countries, often the rising sort of nations, we see that remittances represent a sort of smaller, probably declining, source of foreign current currency and foreign direct investment is much more important. 
we also see still a very big gap between remittances and development assistance. But it somehow shows some of the ambiguities, particularly the assumption, and we'll come back to that later, that migration and remittances are an efficient mechanism to reduce poverty. That is only a partial truth, and particularly at the macro level, we see a clear pattern here. Most remittances don't go to the lowest income countries. But if we look at the relative dependence of countries, of the same three group of countries on remittances, we see that because gen national incomes are so low in, in, in low income countries that although the absolute level is quite low in relative terms, in terms of relative dependency, low income countries are much more dependent on average on remittances than low and upper middle income countries. And perhaps this tells us something about certain levels of dependency on remittances, which can lead to an unhealthy dependence on foreign currency. And perhaps it's a right mix, which we might see in lower and upper middle income countries, where remittances represent a much smaller share of GDP, but these countries are also able to attract other foreign currency sources, particularly foreign direct investment, which perhaps reflects a better investment environment. And perhaps in those circumstances, remittances could play a different role than sustaining cycles of dependency. Now, as I said, migration has really become a sort of new development mantra. And agencies like the International Organization of Migration and development agencies like the World Bank have really recently portrayed migrants as agents for development. And I think the picture on the bottom right is kind of symbolizing what's often meant by this. This idea of it's not about brain drain, no, it's about migrants returning to their origin countries, bringing not only money back, but also new entrepreneurial ideas, new ways of dealing with economic development, new ways of governance and economic, um, economic policies, which can really help to reform countries and create a sort of environment for takeoff development. It's been a complete reversal of the brain brain hypothesis. The other idea in which makes migration and remittances often very attractive for policymakers is the idea that this helps bottom up development. The idea of migrants themselves help development, not governments are responsible. Migrants themselves, they will make development. Now, as I was stressed in my conclusion, this has also been part of the critique on those theories because they shift away the responsibility from states and that the emphasis on migrants' individual responsibilities may in that sense be unwarranted and harmful. It is also useful to stress that this is not, new, not a new issue and that there have been many mood swings in a way, in the way that the issue of migration development has been considered. And if we can say roughly until the oil crisis in 1973, migration was seen as a driver of industrialization and capitalist development in sending and receiving countries, more or less along the lines of neoclassical and developmental theories uh, which saw migration as a great way to, to, to reduce differences in wages, to help origin countries, but at the same time also help receiving countries in the processes of economic growth, because it led to a more optimal allocation of the factors of production. Then we entered the long phase of pessimism, where the dominant narrative was that migration undermines development in sending countries. It leads to brain drain, dependency on remittances, it leads to an appreciation of currency because remittances, um, remittances lead to an, an appreciation of, of, the, of the domestic currency, which weakens the export position of developing countries. It's led to a very sort of grim outlook about migration development. And it was even said by a high ILO official somewhere in the 1990s that migration and development, nobody believes it anymore. It was no migration and development, but the idea was we have either migration or development, and development is the only way to stem migration. As I've highlighted already in the previous lecture, and I will do again in the last lecture, this is a problematic assumption. But it's been quite, quite astonishing how since 2000, we have seen a complete turnaround of views under the influence of surging remittances and key actors in the development community, which suddenly have turned upside down the whole reasoning and have portrayed migration as a great source of development. 
This leads us to the question, what is the impact of migration and development in origin societies? And as I will show, it will also force us to go beyond a sort of dichotomous framework of benefits versus costs or optimistic or pessimistic views on, on, on migration to achieve a much more nuanced perspective, which leads us to understand the heterogeneity, the diversity of migration impacts through distinguishing levels of, 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 of analysis, both about which social groups we're talking about and whether we're talking, for instance, about communities, regions, nations, or the entire world. So what kind of development and for whom? We're talking about economic growth? Are we talking about inequality? Are we talking about human development or so social development? Are we talking about education? Impacts might very much differ across those areas. And we also need to contextualize our understanding of migration and development. So how do the general development and investment context and institutional environments affect migration impacts? How can this make us understand why migration has more positive impacts in particular regions and countries and more neutral or negative effects in others? Now, the key point of this lecture is the following, that despite their development potential, migration and remittances can neither be blamed for a lack of development nor be expected to trigger take of development in generally an attractive investment environment. It is in this sense very important not to attribute too much importance to migration, to see migration more as a process that tends to reinforce prior conditions. Where these were positive, migration tends to uh, 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 accelerate and reinforce those positive tendencies. But if the environment is very unattractive, um, politically and economically, it is very naive to expect migrants to return and invest in great numbers. And we can go back, and it is useful to go back to the general theories on causes of migration, so the functionalist and structuralist perspectives, because these theories are dynamic. They all not only say something about what causes migration, but also have built-in assumptions about the impacts of migration, and there they are fundamentally opposed. They have fundamentally different predictions about the effects of migration on broader development processes. Whereas it's still possible to combine to a certain extent their reasonings about what causes migration, this becomes much more problematic when we look at the impacts of migration. Where well, we see a clear divide between migration pessimists, which are linked to this structuralist school in social theory, but also in migration theory, and immigration optimists, which are much more linked to the neoclassical and functionalist theories. The two narratives are completely different. Migration pessimists would argue that migration is a selective process. It's generally the best and brightest that tend to migrate away from rural societies. It's lead to a depletion of labor, for instance, if people could work on the family farm or in certain traditional industries. It also leads to the filtering away of the higher skilled. And although some money might be sent back, it's the receiving wealthy countries that by and large benefit from this migration. And those people that have been educated with often public funds from government in poor countries are being siphoned off by the industries of the North. So it leads to a significant brain drain. And because migration is a selective process, it's very naive to think that migration would help the poor. Now, if it's rather, and this is the case often, if it's rather the poor, the, the relatively well off, that migrate more, how can we expect that migration will decrease inequality? Because it's already the better off, let's say the middle classes, that will benefit from remittances. And yes, remittances do benefit origin households, but they're mostly used for consumption. They're not really invested, as many studies show, in investment. So how can we expect, expect this to trigger development? So by and large, it reinforces processes of dependency. It might help individual families, but the idea that migration and remittances will help countries in the development is fundamentally problematic. Rather, it tends to reinforce the dependency and it tends to increase divergence and inequality between sending and receiving societies. And this will perpetuate the cycle of migration. 
because people will become dependent on migration instead of production and economic processes in their own co countries. Now, migration pro uh, optimists turn this entire perspective completely upside down. They would argue it's naive to think that peasant families will stay peasants forever. Their conditions were very dismal in many cases before processes of capitalist development were set in motion. It actually enabled them to significantly improve their health and livelihoods in the first place, which also facilitated them to move away. And particularly for those groups in traditional societies that were oppressed, it was a great opportunity to be able to migrate away, first to the city and later on abroad. And it's very naive to think that once a migrant's gone away, it's going to be a loss. Because migrants, particularly at this time with transnational connections and travel, can re-import back their knowledge and money. And this is what we see in practice of. It is very naive to assume that once a person is away, it's lost. Actually, once abroad, because many migrants or non-migrants are unemployed in a country of origin, they become much more productive once they migrate abroad. They can also further their education and, and gain new skills and knowledge, which then can be reinvested in their origin countries. So it's, it's naive to think that once a migrant is away, it's a loss. Now, effectively, it increases the development potential of the populations of origin countries. So a brain drain can become a brain gain. It can also stimulate people who remain behind to continue education if migration is going to be seen as one major way to improve your circumstances. And for the skilled migrants, the doors are often open in receiving countries, so migration leads to higher incentives to go to school. And it is naive to think that migration will just be a prerogative of the middle classes. What we often see is through network effects, that more and more migrants, uh, also from the less well-to-do groups, are able to migrate. And that some of the money that's being invested by migrants and spent by migrants is going to be stimulating economic growth in origin societies. For instance, the construction of houses, which is often decried as consumption or consumptive investments, has in many origin countries led to the growth of the construction sector, which has provided a lot of employment for non-migrants as well. So these, these uh, multiplier effects explain why often out-migration areas have become relatively wealthy and thriving. So migration facilitates development. In the longer term, in particular, it leads to a stronger convergence. And in the end, this will also lead to less migration. So these are two completely opposed narratives. Now, the problem is that the reality is somewhere in the middle, and that we see more positive and more negative impacts in different contexts. And that in this sense, those two big group of theories, which are still linked to the sort of structuralist and functionalist school in social science and migration theory, are too deterministic because in reality we see much higher diversity. So the new economics of labor migration, which I reviewed in my last lecture, but also affiliated approaches like livelihood approaches and transnational studies, tend to provide a much richer perspective which have room for both agency and structure, and tend to portray international migration as a transnational household co-insurance strategy aiming to spread livelihood risks, increase income and capabilities, and overcome structural development constraints. So they de-link return and development because they stress the role of remittances, but also knowledge transfer, which is not necessarily linked to return. It can be linked to temporary return or even transmission of ideas through communication technology. This group of theories and increasing empirical research led to growing insights on the potentially positive impacts of migration and remittances. They rejected the deterministic in views of migration developments, either positive or negative, and increasingly emphasized the contextuality of the development impacts of migration. And I'll explain what I mean by contextuality. But let me first very briefly review the evidence we have on migration and development. Most micro-studies seem to confirm the prediction by the new economic of aid migration that migration, particularly in poorer countries, is a form of risk-spreading behavior 
but in many cases does lead to real incomes, in increases in income and well-being. E and that is even the case for internal migration. So for individual migrants and their families, migration does seem to be a rational choice. Although failure occurs by and large, the studies show that migration is a strategy for advancing the well-being and economic status of households and communities of origin. What about remittances? There we have the so-called consumption versus investment debate. Some points of critique have been developed. First of all, not, consumption is not bad. Uh, for poor households, it's perfectly logical to consume, to invest your money in food, education, housing. One can even argue whether education and housing are actually forms of consumption. But also if we think about, for instance, um, um, Education is certainly not consumption, but for instance, housing, I highlighted, the very positive effect it can have on local economies, but also, of course, it just improves living conditions of households of origin. And by sort of saying migrants shouldn't invest in housing, we, <coughs> as Western observers and researchers, tend to apply very different standards to migrants and we would apply it to ourselves because we also tend to buy houses. Second issue is that the level to which people invest their money in productive enterprises of course is very much dependent on how attractive the investment environment is. Now the evidence on poverty and inequality is quite ambiguous and I already highlighted the reasons. Most migrants come neither from the poorest countries nor from the poorest sections of those countries. But through the expenditure and investment of, of remittances, some of the benefits of uh, migration do trickle down to poorer people, although to a limited extent, but it does therefore have some poverty alleviating effect. And of course, some people do manage to migrate. What about brain drain and brain gain? Also here we see a very mixed image. And again, this is very much dependent on the perspective that origin countries provide for migrants. But it is also very dependent on who is actually migrating and under which circumstances are people migrating. Is it the highest skilled? Is it the lowest skilled? But even if the highest skilled migrant were, were the, were the highest skilled unemployed before they went abroad, these are all important questions. But overall, there seems to be a high level of exaggeration in this debate. That Although in some cases the effect is positive and in some it is negative, it would be naive to think that brain drain is a cause of underdevelopment. It seems to be rather a symptom of underdevelopment, a lack of prospects some countries seem to provide for the higher skilled populations. What about the idea that migration remittances can trigger national development? There are some macro studies on this, but there also the evidence seems pretty conclusive that if there's any effect at all, at all, it is a very limited effect. And that there we really need to revisit the causality. You first need national development and an attractive investment environment before you can expect migrants to invest. The last potentially very important issue is about the political impacts of migration. It's been less considered, but it's a very interesting question because if you think about the necessity for general reform to improve general investment and development context, this is a key issue. But here also migration can have very ambiguous impact. If it's the elites that mainly migrate, of course it would be naive to assume that migration will automatically lead to political change. It might actually reinforce the position of political elites. But in other circumstances, migrations, migrants might form an opposition from abroad and might play a very important role in triggering political change in origin countries. On the other hand, that's the third scenario, the lack of migration opportunities may also increase the pressure on governments to change. So if unemployment goes up and there's no safety valve in the third form of migration, this might, of course, turn people's attention inward. And this might perhaps have played an, a, a role in triggering the Arab revolution in a country like Tunisia, because due to the economic crisis in Europe, migration opportunities were limited. Now, to wrap this up, I think what the evidence shows is that migration can neither be blamed for lack of development, nor be expected to tra trigger takeoff development. 
And that despite their considerable benefit on the micro level, and to a certain extent on the regional level for individuals and communities, it would be naive to assume that migration alone cannot re can remove structural development constraints. If states fail to implement reform, migration is very unlikely to fuel development, and actually it can sustain situations of underdevelopment, where migration can be a very effective mechanism for our origin country governments to vent off any pressure and to prevent pressure for reform. The flip side of this is that if development takes a positive turn and reform occurs, migrants are likely to reinforce those positive threats because they're the first one to recognize change and they do have this transnational knowledge and language skills, they will be the first to recognize opportunities and to invest in return. And this has happened in many countries like Taiwan, South Korea, and most recently also Turkey and uh, for instance Kerala and India, where migrants have played a big role in triggering uh, economic uh, and reinforcing economic development. But the issue is that migration wasn't the initial cause, but migration has reinforced those processes. This brings me to the sort of initial issue I started with, that migration has been put very high on the political agendas. And that some of the criticism has been by groups who protested against big summits that have been held, like here this global forum on migration development in Manila a few years ago, that the focus of migration development, the focus of migration development as a bottom-up form of development, is revealing a neoliberal agenda, which tries to shift the attention away from the responsibilities of governments, create proper conditions for development, and to protect migrants' rights. So migration tends to reinforce existing development processes rather than radically altering their direction. It somehow shows that we still somehow need the initial conditions to be right, hence the, the stress on reform uh, as a necessity for migration and development to occur to leverage this positive link. Now there might be exceptions to the rule that migration cannot really change the direction of development. Like if we have truly mass immigration, particularly migrants, but perhaps in those situations migrants living abroad can make a real sort of decisive change. So the diasporas in certain things can perhaps have a big impact on political transformation, which seems to have a higher transformative power than remittances alone. And this links me back to the other issue that a lack of migration opportunity can remove this function of migration as a safety valve for elites and can perhaps increase the pressure uh, for political change in origin countries. And this brings me back to the last issue. If we take on board all this knowledge, what can we learn about policy? Now, a lot of the policy attention by governments and institutions like the World Bank have been focused on issues like facilitating remittances, making it easy to transfer money, for instance, Origin countries have increasingly recognized migrants as citizens instead of traders and have tried to develop so-called diaspora engagement policies. The issue is that looking at the evidence, there's two issues that really matter in determining the extent to which migration can be um, a, a positive factor in developing processes in origin countries. First of all, the general economic and political climate in sending countries. And second, the immigration and integration policies of receiving countries, because they affect the selectivity of migration, the access of relatively poor to migration, which then also affects the poverty alleviation function of migrants, and particularly the rights and socioeconomic mobility of migrants. Because in the end, that will determine the development potential of migration. The better the position of migrants in receiving countries, the higher their potential contribution to development in origin societies. So migrants with good jobs, good education, and citizenship rights will have the highest tendency or the highest potential to circulate and return to origin countries and play an important role in development processes. So this is why it's important to look at immigration integration issues and development issues simultaneously. So I hope that this lecture has stressed how migration affects development in various ways, and how it would be naive to assume that migration is either a threat or a solution to development issues.
bringing me back to the broader issue that migration needs to be seen as an intrinsic part of broader development processes and that the nature of those development processes, whether negative or positive, and the nature of migration processes, whether it's the elites or the relatively poor that can migrate, and how their position is in receiving countries will also fundamentally condition the types of impact migration can have on development processes in origin countries.